Good afternoon, everybody. This is the PFI Celebrating Earth Day meeting, and I'd like to welcome you all. I was just saying that maybe at the end of this recording, we can introduce ourselves. We will have a sort of open spiritual cafe at the end. So, but for the purposes of the actual meeting, we're going to be recording, and we have a wonderful group of people who will be talking about the environment, about the earth and our way of celebrating Earth Day, which is, of course, tomorrow, April 22nd. But first of all, as in many of our meetings, we always start with a spiritual opening. So I'd like to hand over the mic to Gwydon. Right. And um, I would like us all to just close the right and center for a second and breathe if you have a candle you can light it no problem and i want to open with a short poem that was written by selena fox in 2011 if you just listen and see where it takes you power the sacred fire guide us in this work to bring healing to planet earth May we stop water pollution and ocean destruction. May we bring forth cleaner water and ocean preservation. Power the sacred water, guide us in this work to bring healing to planet Earth. May we put an end to social and spiritual toxicity. May we bring forth peace and spiritual harmony. Power the sacred spirit, Guide us in this work to bring healing to planet Earth. May we live in harmony with other humans. May we live in harmony with all of nature on this planet and beyond. May we work together to end planetary sickness. May we work together to bring forth planetary wellness. Power of Mother Nature guide us in this work to bring healing to planet earth so more it be so must it be so more it be and i would like to introduce our speaker morgana sitho is a wiccan elder uri global trustee for multi-region and also uh, an international coordinator for pagan federation international um, I'll give the mic to you now. So thank you very much for the uh, welcome. Today, uh, it, I, I, it was my birthday a few days ago, but there, uh, there was somebody whose birthday it was uh, on April the 6th. And today I would really, really like to show you a presentation honoring Jane Goodall. Let me just set it up. Oh, hang on. As usual. <laughs> so, can everybody see? This is actually, um, I was at the, uh, uh, I'll explain in a little in a minute, actually in The Hague when we celebrated her birthday in the Netherlands. So, Jane Goodall, I think most of you will know who Jane is, but for those who don't, she is a renowned primatologist, ethnologist, and anthropologist, best known for her groundbreaking work with chimpanzees in Tanzania. And she was born on April the 3rd, 1934, in London, England. Jane's work has had significant impact on our understanding of primate behaviour, conservation, and the relationship between humans and animals. Her journey began in the 1960s when she travelled to Tanzania to study chimpanzees in their natural habitat at Gombe Stream National Park. Throughout her life, she has received many numerous awards and honours for her work, including being named the United Nations Messenger of Peace 
and being appointed Dane Commander of the Order of the British Empire, or OBE or DBE. Her work continues to inspire people around the world to care for the natural world and work towards a more sustainable future. On Saturday, April 6, I was a guest at her 90th birthday celebration in The Hague. It was organised by the Jane Goodall Institute in the Netherlands, which also promotes the youth programme Roots and Shoots. This is a global youth-led environmental and humanitarian programme that she founded in 1991. The project aims to empower young people to become compassionate leaders and active citizens in their local communities and to work towards creating a better world for people, animals and the environment. The roots represent the ideas and values that support the project, such as respect for all living things, diversity and interconnectedness. The shoots symbolises the actions taken by young people to make positive change in their communities. When we were in The Hague, we were shown this film or documentary, Reasons for Hope. And it started off with a viewing, first of all, the photo exhibition, but then we saw this short documentary. There is a trailer, I'll give you the link to the trailer when we're in the chat session. Drawing on decades of work by the world's most famous living ethnologist and environmentalist, Jane Goodall, Reasons for Hope, is an uplifting journey around the globe to highlight good news stories that will inspire people to make a difference in the world around them. Featured stories such as the northern bald ibis migration over the Alps, the reintroduction of the American bison by the Blackfeet Nation, the worldwide recognised Sudbury regreening story, and inspiring youth-led initiatives involved in Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots align with historic footage of Jane's beginnings as a chimpanzee researcher. Throughout the film, the, throughout the film reinforces Jane's four pillars of hope that signal tremendous hope for the future and the amazing of human intellect, the resilience of nature, the power and dedication of young people and the indomitable human spirit. Jane revolutionized how we view the world around us. Join her on this adventure of inspiration and hope. I say I'll give you the link to the trailer afterwards. These are some of the um, pictures of the projects she was involved with. The Sudbury regreening was actually, um, you can see a picture of her planting trees with Justin Trudeau. Um, this was quite important because um, in Canada, the had uh, there had been discovered uh, a nickel mining um, but the actual miners saw how the earth was being absolutely scarred with all the mining techniques and what have you and they decided collectively to re-green the area and Jane was part of this process of re-greening the whole area around where the Sudbury mine had been and that continues so you can see one of the pictures there with the Sudbury re-greening story the before and after The story of the northern bald ibis was also quite interesting because the you can see there there's a micro light and what they done actually there were a group of people in Austria and they had a, a group of the bald ibis which is a bird and they brought them up from little babies little baby birds but they did not have the knowledge, or at least they thought they may not have the knowledge of actually returning to their breeding, back to their migration in Italy. So they actually got the microlites, fitted them up, and actually guided a group of the birds across the Alps. Can you believe this? <laughs> <A> microlites <laughs> way up in the mountains, 
and they actually got to um, got to Italy. So, and they, but they actually realised as well that the birds instinctively knew and followed the microlight, but they seemed to also instinctively know where they were going. So this has been very, this has been a wonderful project of the con connectedness between um, the bird mothers who were actually humans, there were a lot of young people involved, and the connectedness between animals, but also the environment and how um, animals also connect with their environment for things like migration. The last one which was mentioned was the reintroduction of the American bison by the Blackfeet Nation. It was it was amazing to hear that the um, the bison or the buffalo had been actually wiped out. Something like 60 million, 60 million bison had been completely wiped out uh, by the 1900s, the late 1800s actually. But a few were actually taken to Canada. Again, Canada comes into the picture and were preserved. And then in, uh, I think uh, it was in the 2000s, they were reintroduced into uh, the um where the Blackfoot Nation are settled, it's uh, part of Montana. And now they're actually reintegrating and reintroducing the American bison, which is, again, so important to American, um, also the mythology and the connection with the bison and the, uh, with the native uh, Americans. And many of these projects you can actually see and, and it's certainly worth looking at because this is also a way that Jane has, she, she, she says as well, you know, we must never lose hope, even in the darkest moments, never lose hope that we as people can join together, join together with the environment and still make a difference. So there we were in the Netherlands, wishing Jane a happy birthday from the Netherlands, as I said, and wishing her many, many years to come. She's amazing. She's still very, very sprightly, and you just wouldn't believe that she is 90 years old. So happy birthday to Jane from the Netherlands. Here she is, and um, uh, uh, there is a video. I'll send the link later as well. And then she was actually saying what she would like, what her birthday wish is, and her birthday wish was for a project as you might expect, for the chimpanzees and a project called Chimp Eden. Just amazing care, have wonderful facilities, and people keep asking, what would you like? I'm going to have to cut that short because, uh, as I was explaining a bit earlier, we might be stuck with copyright problems, so that was just a very, very two-second clip. This is, I love this, this mem from Jane. Um, it actually doesn't take much to be considered a difficult woman, as many of the women here know how difficult it is being strong women. But as she says, it doesn't take that much to be considered a difficult woman. That's why there are so many of us. So but this is also for the men who are also very, very inclined to helping uh, the environment and, of course, celebrating Mother Earth Day, which is tomorrow, of course. Here are all the links, as I will be posting much of this um, later, so that you can all have a check at the links I've sent and sit back and just enjoy some of the work that Jane Goodall has been doing. Thank you. So, I'm going to stop sharing there. Our next speaker is I have to just check because I haven't got the program in front of me, of course. It's of Catherine. Course, of course, it's our very special Catherine from Canada. And Catherine has um, been uh, the national coordinator for PFI Canada for a couple of years now. At uh, first, she didn't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> but we're convinced that she was the right person to to continue uh, PFI in Canada. And of course, she is very much involved, uh, not only with interfaith, but also with Indigenous people. So I asked Catherine today to talk about, the, mentioned the Sudbury regreening, but also the reintroduction of the bison. And Catherine said, oh, well, there was quite a lot of connection also in Canada. So 
go ahead, uh, uh, Catherine, and uh, tell us a little bit more about Earth Wisdom and Indigenous people in Canada. And I think you have my presentation. I do. Perfect. Thank you. I'm having the same problem I had with mine at the moment. It's just a minute, just two seconds. Just start from the beginning. Yeah, Quit I, from I, the, I'm the I'm beginning. Trying, I'm just trying to, yeah, there we go. So can everybody see? Yep, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine, go ahead. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Next slide. So um, land acknowledgement in, um, as part of reconciliation with First Nations, um, it is important for gatherings in Canada to start the land acknowledgement. To write a land acknowledgement, we are encouraged to learn about the land we live on and the people who came before us. The first one I wrote includes places important to my family. Um, I was born in, um, in the U.S., and so various locations in the U.S. Were, are featured in that first land um, acknowledgement that I wrote. Now I call Toronto my home. I live on the traditional land of the, of the Anishinaabe here in Wendat, the Cree, the Mississaugas, and many other peoples since time immemorial. It is under the dish with one spoon treaty between the Iroquois and Ojibwe nations. Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaty. Toronto, a te Caranto, is still home to many indigenous First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, as well as a lot of immigrants from all over the world. Together, we are learning how to take care of this land around Lake Ontario also known as the land, Lake of Shining Waters, McWitch. Next side, slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about a program that was started um, called the Guardians. And the Guardians help ind Indigenous nations honor their responsibility to care for the lands and the waters. They serve as the eyes and ears on, tr on traditional territories. The Guardians are trained Indigenous experts who manage protected areas, restore animals and plants, test water quality, and monitor developments. They connect youth with elders and provide training. And this connection is so important because during various points in time in Canadian history with our Indigenous people, terrible things were done and children were and families were torn apart and children were taken away from elders and didn't receive the training they normally would have gotten and this has left cultural scars that are just now being healed um the things that that they do these guardians they engage with other landowners they strengthen the decision-making and determining of what happens on the land because they are there on the land and actually seeing and doing real research and monitoring. And they create and foster local economic opportunities. How did it start? It started with an indigenous guardians network. Um, most of the the strongest allies in this seem to be, and I say seem because this is a loose history, um, on the West Coast in BC and Northwest Territories. In 2015, they gained support from the, the Assembly of First Nations and started to try 
at that point to get funding from federal government. That funding did come, although I have a feeling and I haven't seen the full federal budget yet, but um, something tells me that some of this funding got cut this year. So they're always, plus they're always looking for donations to help them with this work. Um, the indigenous led initiatives program has built collaborations between indigenous peoples and crown agencies. Crown agencies are arm's length agencies with the federal government. So they're not, they're, they're funded by the federal government, but they are not federal agent. They're not in the government. So they can make decisions that are um, in, independent of government. Uh, this particular um, picture is of a um, totem pole in the Heidi, Na uh, Heidi Gwai Nation and um, is one of, one of the poles that was um, saved from work that they've, that they've done. Next slide, please. So um, there's a beautiful um, website that tell that goes through the steps on how to form a guardian organization within a tribal nation. And this is where I got this information from. And I, I just love the way it was set up. Um, these are some of the things that they do. Um, and they provide, I'm just going to highlight a couple of these. Uh, I, I loved um, increased protection of cultural and ecological values. More influence and control over resource management issues in the territory. Um, increased use of indigenous knowledge and integration into decision making even down to how they make decisions using more traditional ways of doing that. Um, improved community well-being and improved relationship and new connections with neighboring communities. Next slide. So I'm gonna highlight a few of the projects of the guardians. There are approximately 160 First Nation Guardian groups registered in Canada. They go from coast to coast to coast. Um, and we say it that way because we have three coasts. Um, on the East Coast, in the Inu National Environmental Guardians Group in Labrador, they manage all environmental programs, including a, a greening, I, I, to use the term used in the previous um, presentation, of a Voisai Bay mine, which is another, it was a copper mine that was on indigenous territory. And they're now going back to clean it up and to bring it back into something that can is more environmental for their community. In the Lusty K uh, First Nations in North Territories, they monitor the caribou. This is the largest caribou herd in the world. And they monitor the migrations back and forth across um, across the Alaskan border into Canada and back. So they monitor the health of that, that herd. They also monitor water, water quality and they're making, um, doing a lot of research in the impacts of climate change in the Northwest. So having to do with um, permafrost and things melting in the North things of that nature. So the whole environment in that um, they hold. The um, next one, and this is the largest group that I was able to find on the West Coast, uh, is the Coastal Guardian Watchmen. 
and Heidi Guell. They, um, this is actually a collection from different territories that have bonded together and worked together. They work, and one of the things that they've done that's very interesting is they partner and have formed indigenous ecotourism partners that reconnect indigenous communities to traditional territories and provide stewardship along the, the coast. And they're the ones that run ecotourism in that area. So if you want to see some of these areas, you can have, you can work with indigenous people who are on the ground, who will show you and share their their land with you and, and talk about what they're doing and what they, they what they have. And one of the things that you can can see are the great spirit bears. So they operate in the great bear rainforest and spirit bears. And this is a picture of one. Um, they are not polar bears. They are not white bears. They're actually brown bears or black bears that have a very different DNA mutation. And so you'll even see a black bear with a white cub. So it, their, their fur is completely white from roots to tips. Um, and they're considered magical and highly protected. Um, they've also developed a conservation economy with 85% of the rainforest is legally protected. And they did this with, in partnership with forestry organizations and environmental organizations. The remaining 15% is also highly legislated to protect and to maintain um, a balance of the environment. So very important. And this is a huge, this rainforest is very important to the entire Western region of Canada. Next slide. And now we talk about the bison. Uh, First Nations peoples have long been stewards of the lands and waters and their wisdom and knowledge are crucial if we are to protect and conserve the planet, plants and animals that we love. The Sturgeon River wild bison and indigenous guardians of this area is a very important project. The Sturgeon River wild bison are the last wild herd in uh, Saskatchewan. And it's in a tradition, it's in the traditional habitat range under their territory. This herd has been reduced, had been reduced from 500 in 2000 to 120 today. which is why we're very grateful now that the guardians have moved in to try to protect this. The reason for that is for hunting, over hunting and some of the bison, they go off the, the they, because they, they're herd and they, they follow patterns and such. They, um, they're not always in their little enclosed area of the park and they get out onto farmers' lands, and there was um, hunting that was being done whenever they did that. In 2018, this tribe became a member of the Buffalo Treaty. This is a nation-to-nation -nation treaty that follows the spirit and intent of ancient interactions between indigenous groups as they shared the Great Plains and lived nomadic lives and followed the buffalo across the continent. So the Blackfeet nation that was mentioned again in the previous slide, um, this nation, the Mistak was, I, my indigenous language is very poor. They're part of this, there was 10 tribes that were part of this um, treaty to protect uh, from Canada and the US. In 2019, the Guardians program became one of the first 22 First Nations projects 
to receive money through the Indigenous Guardian Pilot Program from the federal government. They were selected, the guardians are selected from the First Nation. And they, this is First Nation historically has lived and survived with these buffaloes, buffalo, and have a deep commitment to regaining their traditional connections to the buffalo, both culturally and spiritually. The long-term vision is to use what the guardians learn to bring a new herd to their lands. The benefits of strengthening the herd include improved ecological stability of the region, enhanced ecological integrity of their lands, and enhanced food security. The Guardians partner with landowners, municipalities, wildlife groups, and other indigenous groups to protect the herd. Next slide. Oh, this is what the herd looks like. And there's a little baby. Um, and I want to thank you. Um, and if you want more information about the Guardians, just do a search in Google for Indigenous Guardians Canada and you will find all sorts of information. Thank you very much. Liquid. Oh, and it's my honor, and of course, my phone decides to go back, and so I have to find thing. I'll screw it. Rowan wrote, uh, Rowan has a lovely bio. Rowan is my, my sister in the craft. I've known her for a very long time. And she is a priestess extraordinaire. She is in, um, I'm going to mispronounce the word. She's many, many things to many, many traditions, including um, a, a priestess of Bridget. And I dearly love her. And I hope that you will enjoy what she has to share with us. Thank you kindly. I was told I can't say where I'm from, but I'm on the unceded land of the Tamian people, and I acknowledge that um, fact. Uh, so th this presentation, it's not a presentation, it's a reflection, grew out of my attendance at the Parliament of the World's Religions in 2004 in Barcelona, where there were four tracks of world problems and one of the world problems was water. And so many of us pagan types did the water track. And so each year I do some version of this presentation with updated statistics and the exhortation to pagans that we have a special duty toward water. Water is everywhere in our bodies, in our world. Water is the original source of life and all life contains water. Water connects all living things and we cannot exist without it. Water is sacred, entitled to reverence and respect. All peoples have venerated water. Many have seen the source of rivers as being in the other world. Ganga came down from heaven and became the Ganges. Boan cracked the well of Sagais and became the river Boyne. Sequana is the goddess of the Seine. Many rivers in Europe echo the name of Danu, the great mother goddess. We have the Danube, the Don, the Dnieper, all echoes of her life-giving presence. In Africa, Oshun, Oya, and Yamaja were rivers. The rivers of China are also goddesses, Longmu, Loshin, Xingxushin, and many more. Besides Ganga in the Indian subcontinent, there are Sarasvati, Yamuna, Sindhu, goddess of the Indus River, and many more. Whatever pagan tradition we follow, there are probably river goddesses in our pantheons. We have sea gods and goddesses also, but sea is not drinking water. Of all the water in our world, only 2.5% is fresh water. And of that, 69% is in glaciers, 30% in groundwater, and only one third of 1% in renewable supplies in lakes and waterways. So little. And yet we pollute it with inadequate sanitation, with industrial waste, and with our lack of care in using water as a dumping ground. This is not the way to treat a sacred life-giving element. 
there's a looming crisis around access to potable water in this world. Around 2 billion people do not have access to clean and safe drinking water. Further, about 4 billion people, representing nearly two-thirds of the world population, experience severe water scarcity during at least one month of the year. Approximately 3.6 billion people, 46% of the world's population, lack adequate sanitation services. In addition, 5 million people, 2.2 million of them children, die each year from water-related diseases such as cholera and diphtheria. Unclean water and poor sanitation have claimed more lives over the past 100 years than any other cause. And this is not a third world problem. Yes, the greatest problems of bad sanitation and poverty are in the third world, but industries and agriculture, cities and governments around the world pollute and mismanage water. Just ask the folks in Flint, Michigan. And there is a recent and growing problem. Water is becoming privatized and commoditized around the world. When water is held as a commodity for profit rather than a human right and a sacred trust, the problems get that much worse. One of the things that the parliaments of the world's religions had been the resacralizing of the earth. In recognition that our modern world has lost the sense of sacredness and that our survival as ecological beings demand that we find a way to bring that sense of veneration and respect back into our world. As practitioners of pagan and earth honoring traditions, we should be in the forefront of that effort. We have a history of regarding the earth as sacred. We have tools of magic, and now we need the will to step forward and walk our talk. We as pagans need to be aware of the issue of access to clean water, we as citizens of the world need to be aware of where our own water comes from and who controls it. At the Barcelona Parliament in 2004, a number of pagans attended the water assembly at Montserrat, and we have called for pagans around the world to accept a special relationship with water in our own regions, adopt a well or spring, a creek or river, a lake or reservoir, do ritual, clean the area, defend its purity, and advocate on its behalf. Speak to the goddesses, the spirits of the waters, remind them of their sacredness, and remind your communities that waters are sacred. May it be so. Be shame our shin. Blessed be. Yes. And I'm a defender of Coyote Creek, which is the creek nearest to my house. And uh, many years I spent in canoes cleaning the waste that industrial people seem to feel the need to chuck into their rivers. So that is how I fulfill that promise and also by raising awareness. Thank you, Reverend Rowan. It's been wonderful. I, I remember this reflection uh, before and I said, you know, this is the one thing that really came across in your, your whole presentation, of course, is the fact that we're talking about potable water water we can drink and it's i it, it's so sad it's so sad the way we treat our rivers uh but fortunately in some cultures waters are and rivers are being seen as actual living entities so there is some hope there is some hope our next speaker our next presenter is actually elfreya or petra and she was involved can't be any different in a big cleanup very recently at one of the major rivers in the Netherlands, uh, the Maas, uh, which flows very close to where she lives. And so I've asked her to just come and tell us a little bit about her experiences as how how did you experience this? I know um, Gwydon in, in, in Russia, they used to do a lot of the litter cleanups, but this one is a bit special because it's a water cleanup. So, Paige, would you like to go ahead and tell us and also give us a few hints and tips about how we can also regreen the earth? If it's not possible, we'll. There we are. That's much, much better. So thank you. <clears throat> there you go. Um, so we were involved in the mass cleanup. Um, it's quite a nice initiative that they set up. Uh, so every year, sometimes twice a year, um, they do a big cleanup action with a lot of volunteers to clean up the rivers. Um, I have to say this year was a bit disappointing um, the way they organized it because we only had 
maybe an hour to clean up. And then we had to quickly take pictures and those things. So, so it felt a bit more of a promotional thing, but uh, the past years, it was really, really nice. Um, this year throughout the Netherlands, um, I think they said we collected in a day, well, in a couple of hours, 250,000 kilos of trash. Um, just, you know, by the river. So that, that was quite a lot. If you think that we all had maybe only one hour to clean up. Um, so that is something that is uh, quite important, I think, for all of us. Um, and it's something also that we wanted to, well, uh, Sophia was supposed to be here, but she couldn't make it. Um, we were gonna talk about this together. She's on the picture um, here that you see. Um, but this is something that we wanna do more regularly here in the, the south of the Netherlands. Um, just, you know, a couple of times uh, a month. Um, you can actually sign up with volunteer organizations here and just clean up your neighborhood. Um, you get these red bags and you can leave them on the side of the road and then the uh, municipality comes and picks them up. So they work a lot with governments as well, um, local governments, just to try to engage people. Um, does this work? Um, so we have, of course, why do we do them? Um, there's a lot of reasons. Um, of course, as we spoke about the, the clean waters, uh, drinking waters, but it's also something that you can do as, as a community engagement to bring people together and to kind of uh, raise awareness about all the problems um, that uh, water pollution comes with. Um, and of course, the last point that I wrote is just, you know, the kind of scenic views. <laughs> because if we walk around here by the river, you really see a lot of trash and it's not, it's not a nice sight to see. <laughs> Um, apart from having all the environmental impacts, of course, but um, that's a good thing. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, there's this organization called the Pollinators. And um, what you can do is become a food bank for the bees. So you can sign up and then they will send you uh, little bags of seeds. And then people can go to this website that you see here. There's a whole map and you can type in your address and see the nearest food bank to you. And you can go there and get your seed package. And then actually tomorrow it's National Sowing Day. So we can all go out and uh, sow the seeds. <laughs> There's a few uh, tips that they give you, of course, is to find a good spot. You always want to start maybe in your garden or somewhere close by. Make sure that it's not a place that they're going to, you know, uh, mow the lawn. <laughs> You don't want that. Um, also, never sow in nature reserves because you might disrupt the, the, the balance. Um, and how you would do it is to basically loosen the soil, scatter the seeds, press the soil, and then just water. And it's so simple, and it's something that we can do around our neighborhood just to bring you know a bit more life here. Um, last thing. So these are kind of all uh, very active things that you can do. Um, yeah, in your area, uh, is to make seed bombs. Um, and this is a tip that Morgana uh, gave um, that we should talk about. Um, so seed bombs are really, really easy to make and also really fun. Um, and if you, you know, have maybe a younger audience with you, uh, something fun to do together. What you would need is uh, just four things. Um, just, you know, clay powder, or sometimes coffee ground works, but you have to really press it together. Flour works as well. Uh, compost or potting soil, the seeds and water. Um, of course, the seeds that you pick, make sure that they're non-invasive, uh, that the plants are non-invasive. You want um, local seeds. Um, for example, what we get with the pollinators or all you know, plants that can grow annually here. Um, so it's nothing, you know, uh, from other countries, so make sure that it's very appropriate for your area. Um, you want to mix the ingredients, so it's probably three parts clay to one part compost, but you have to kind of play around with the, it's not an exact science. <laughs> um, you want to put the seeds in and then actually make the seed bombs. And it's quite important that you let them dry um, just because you don't want them to fall apart. Um, and how do you use them? We can just, you know, 
throw them, <laughs> um, which actually the, the younger kids really like. Um, and just let nature do the rest, um, as long as there's sunlight and water involved. So you might have to bring some water with you if it's not you know a rainy day, but in the Netherlands, we have plenty of that. Um, that's basically it. It's very easy to do, and uh, it's a nice way to yeah, celebrate Earth Day. That was it. Very short. Thank you, uh, Paige. I was just, I was just uh, looking at it. It was funny actually about the um, there was a a, a program not so long ago. I think it was somewhere in America, South America, which was very difficult to get to, uh, get to, and they were actually using the idea of seed bombs <laughs> from helicopters. And literally, literally throwing them, and then uh, also using the same because they just couldn't get to the areas. But they, they had seen that there had been invasive uh, plants, which were really, really um, destroying other natural uh, plants. Um, I think there was something like plants had been introduced, like for example, like the British had introduced a eucalyptus tree into into India, and of course that is not indigenous to India. Um, and some some plants and some trees are really very 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 invasive and are actually pushed out other original plants and so I thought it was really funny using this idea of um, you know just literally having a ball and then just literally throwing them but they they were using helicopters <laughs> so it's not just child's play this is this is really serious business serious business so we're coming to the end of our program. Um, how how weird is that you know i'm just i'm just looking to see what our program is my telephone has just gone off um before i forget everybody yes indeed we are coming to the end of our hour it's been wonderful to see you all and when we're celebrating earth day i think it's not just the the way we can you know just listen to stories but how we can engage and look at how people have done certain things like like jane goodall and honoring people honoring the first nations for their attempts to regreen the land or reintroduce the bison there's also something which we can do every single day and i call this our talk with the moon as pagans we can have this constant conversation with the moon and that is every single day and celebrate the full moon the tidal uh, the lunar cycle but also the seasonal cycle the solar cycle as well so in any of our meetings we always have this idea of spiritual resilience so i've asked atom and meredith first of all i asked them i asked all everybody have you got any poems to share and atom <laughs> sent me a poem one that he'd written so i I said that was absolutely fabulous. So I'd like to introduce you to Atom and Meredith and ask them to close our meeting with a spiritual closing. So Atom and Meredith, are you ready? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Morgana. Just as a way of introduction, I'd just like to add that uh, Atom and Meredith are co coordinators co-national coordinators for pfi hungary so they're in europe um so many of the things that are happening in uh, america south america are also happening in europe so let's go over and see how you're tackling the problems thank you very kind of you so hello happy earth day to everyone and uh... As all of you, we also celebrating, we lit our own candle in the color of purple, which is uh, also represents the main message of ours in spirituality, the interconnectedness. As much as we would like to celebrate Earth, we need to say that uh, protecting it is one of our most important tasks these days, and it has its aspect of uh, spirituality as much as the scientific aspect so um we would like to focus on the spiritual aspects now as we mostly heard of the others um can you see my screen please yeah yes yes so yeah very good yeah 
Right. So, first of all, as Morgan mentioned, I have written a poem that I would like to share with you. It's called the Earth Day Dance. In the heart of the forest, where the old oaks grow, where the rivers run wide and the gentle winds blow, we gather in circle under the sun's golden ray to honor our earth on this sacred day. Mother of mountains, of rivers and trees, of all that is wild, of the deep mysteries, we offer our thanks for your bountiful grace, for the sun on our skin and the wind on our face. We dance with the elements, earth, air, fire and sea. In the rhythm of nature, we move wild and free with each beat of the drum, with each chant and song. We are part of earth, where we truly belong. From the seeds in the ground to the stars up above, we are all connected by the web of love. So let's care for the earth. Let's answer the call for the earth is our mother and we are her all. With this poem, we wanted to thank Mother Earth for all the blessings and all that he provided us with on his planet. And um, it's important to understand that it's way more that uh, people normally talk about that we get from Earth. Yes, we do get the fruit. Yes, we got the meat. And uh, yes, we got the grains. But that's way more. We actually got everything that's surrounding us from Earth because we are all part of it. And it our, is our home. Our body is built of the same uh, elements that Earth contains, which means from the little seeds as growing of the soil, as our body is being fed by the Earth itself. And as we grow from little children, we take Earth itself inside of us for growing our bodies. And as we grow old, we give our bodies back to Earth as well. But the question is, with all that blessings that we got, what we can do in return? Important to say that, unfortunately, we are not in that perfect harmony anymore that we receive and we give something back because in the past decades, unfortunately, our planet and all its resources were terribly abused. Um, and uh, that caused certain issues that we already heard of today that we see in problems like pollution, like global warming, like uh, poisoning of waters and the disappearance of the rainforest. And many other issues. So uh, we I've written up a few tips that we can do. Some of them may sound a little bit more practical, but everything has its own uh, spiritual aspect. So as we started to say, what we really need to understand is the interconnectedness itself. Like um, as we are living on Earth, as we are a part of it, we can change our own surroundings and if all of us can do just with the reach, then we got a great chance of turning things away and turning things to a better direction. So we need to recognize the importance of responsibility towards our planet. Now, because we're talking about spiritual aspects, meditation is something I put down first because it's important to recognize and it gives us the power to really act for it, um, that how much we are the part of the divine nature of it. There's a meditation I first done a good 20 years ago, and that was I laid on the ground, I closed my eyes, I started to listen to earthly noises surrounding me in nature in a calm place. And uh, I imagined I actually went through uh, of... Uh, 
releasing my own roots to the earth, to the soil, and fill myself with earthly energies and getting into an energy circle with, with the planet itself. And that was a very beautiful uh, uh, sensation that I have repeated quite a few times ever since. And I would like to really encourage everyone to try this because this is a wonderful experience. Now, as this one, actually every other human actions that we do for the environment and its protection, they have their own spiritual values because Earth itself is uh, not just an object, but uh, we can recognize it's a spirit, it's a being, and it's a living and uh, feeling uh, entity that surrounds us and that keeps us alive. So uh, spending time recognizing Earth and its values through practices such as gardening or nature walks, nature trips, really help us to be one with nature and to treasure this. Now, uh, cultivating gratitude for the gifts of Earth, for the clean air and water, to the abundance of life it supports is very important. We have to pledge to live in harmony with nature and uh, work towards the sustainability in daily choices, meaning like check how well the actual product we purchase is robbed, whether we need that plastic bag or not. And all these uh, small decisions are life actually making a very big uh, difference. I can uh, broadly say that in our personal life, um, as we started to uh, watch more recycling, we managed to uh, get to the stage that we now only have to empty our general waste bin half of the times that we uh, used to have because um, they take the big general uh, waste bin like every couple of weeks and in the past it was always full but since we paid more attention to separate the paper, separate the plastic and uh, ensure that we and on also, sorry we have our own animals where well, they're taking care of they, the food waste the food waste so we have zero food waste at all so and well uh, if, if the animals are chicken that you have delicious eggs in exchange of the food waste so that's something to consider for those uh, can afford to do so and um really we managed to reduce waste and get something else instead in exchange from Mother Earth. Uh, it's also a good idea to pray and send positive energies for healing and the restoration of the ecosystem and the vulnerable species, because um, now it's scientifically proven that uh, there's a very good chance that the ozone layer is going to heal itself in our lifetime, as long as uh, we continue our actions. So, all that the scientists are doing is not hopeless, but we still have to add to the spiritual aspects of it as well and urge people around to the right actions. Um, we can seek wisdom from cultures and spiritual traditions, and every location have their own uh, nature spirit they can turn to to prove that Earth is sacred. And of course, uh, the last, a little bit more physical and practical thing that I have to mention, it's uh, that uh, we can always engage in act of uh, like services and, uh, and being activists to promote environmental justice, to protect it for the future generations. So these are the half practical, half spiritual thoughts, but now it's over to Meredith to say the prayer that we thought to say as the spiritual closing of the event. So let's pray to our Mother Earth. Divine Mother Earth, guardian of life's endless cycle, whose soil cradles the seeds of existence, whose waters flow with nurturing grace, whose breath whispers through the rustling leaves, we humbly bow before your boundless beauty and offer our gratitude for your abundant gifts. May we tread gently upon your sacred ground and cherish the harmony of your in interconnected web. Guide us, Mother Earth, in wisdom and compassion 
as we strive to protect and honor your wondrous creation, for in our for in your embrace we find solace and sustenance, forever blessed by your eternal embrace. Blessed be. Thank you. Blessed be. Thank you very, and very, very much. These words and these prayers. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. Uh, I've made a couple of uh, screenshots, but of course we will be uh, using some of these presentations at a later date. Of course, I would like to now draw this the formal part of the meeting to a close, and by this I mean that we will stop recording and thank everybody for bringing such wonderful presentations today and to celebrate tomorrow Earth Day. But of course, we celebrate Earth Day every day. I'd like to thank all of you for participating and hope to see you in a few minutes when we have our open forum. So thank you, again, thank you all again and see you in the open forum after I've finished recording. Thank you.